It almost seems like a bit of a, a fool's errand to ask, how do you measure an employer brand? After all, an employer brand is a completely abstract concept. How do you measure the value of your favorite book, of a parent's love, of anything you care about? And yet, we live in the real world. And when businesses decide to invest money in something, they want to know if it was worth it. So in this, the 10th episode of The Brand Plan, we continue our discussion on data, focusing on output data. How do you measure or look at how well your brand performs? Hey, Marcus. Hey, James. How's it going? It's good. It's good. Uh, it's been a crazy week, so I'm excited to kind of get past this week into something resuming, resembling normalcy, as if such a thing may exist. Absolutely. It's that pre-summer vacation rush when people are trying to get things signed off before they all their stakeholders disappear for a month. So, yeah, yeah. it's been a busy time. Yeah. And, and let's be fair, you know, for people in our line of work, September is when it's like, how do we get in people's calendars so that when the budget comes, they remember, who is that guy I talked to? Who yeah. is that guy? They sounded smart. I got to write that down. They need some money. <laughs> right. That's the game. Absolutely. So today, so last week we talked about data inputs. No one's going to be shocked to hear that today we're talking about data outputs. And that means, yes, that's right, kids. We're talking about how do you measure employer brand? And this is just the question, it's the Gordian knot of employer branding. For my money, it is, It is. It, if, look, I'm going to give a, a full disclosure. I don't think we're going to come to an answer at the end of this podcast. I think we'll come with a lot of answers, but not necessarily the answer. And I know everybody's like, well, what is the thing? You're not going to get that. But I think, I suspect, we haven't really gone into this. And, you know, this is the, the insight into how we record. We do this very live. Um, I suspect we'll come up with a lot of good ways to think and talk about and approach it so that you understand what you're doing. I think that's the ultimate goal. Marcus, is my misconstruing? What do you think we're going? Where do you think uh, we're going? No, I've got an equation down here. that No, no, he's absolutely right. There is there is no sort of hard answer. I think it's... It's the question that so many of you ask us, the agencies, when you send out an invitation to tender to come and do an EVP and employee brand for you is, is, by the way, how do we measure one of these things? And it's one of those questions I've answered maybe 200 times in the last five years in writing for companies of all different sizes. Look, here are the things you can measure. Here are the things you can't. I guess the other phrase we're going to get into today is return on investment. How are we going to explain what we mean by return on investment? And can we? And what? It's going to be easier for some of you than others to use that phrase, yeah. and, but we'll we'll get on to that. I don't want to kind of jump straight to return on investment, but yeah, how do we measure everything? How do we measure what yeah, we've and, done? And full disclosure, even if you had an equation, most of us would be like, no, really, what's the answer? We don't we don't have, <laughs> we don't want what that means. What's that really weird sign? I don't know. Okay, right? That's, yeah, we're not math people. We're not math people. Absolutely. All right. So, so let's 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 start with some basics, right? Um, hmm. Maybe we got to just have a quick reminder because we're going to talk about employer brand. We're going to talk about EVP. We're going to quote unquote measure them. For those of you listening, I'm using air quotes and bunny ears. Um, we're going to measure these things. So let's start by just kind of have a quick three, 30 second reminder. What is the difference between the two? Absolutely. So the very first thing you need to work out when you're measuring something is what am I measuring? So for example, some of you use the phrase to employer brand to mean employer reputation, in which case the thing mm -hmm. you're measuring is what do other people think of you? But some of you don't, and I, I tend not to. And by employer brand, you mean the stuff that we've done, in which case you're trying to measure what is the activity that we've done and what impact has it had. And, you know, and then it gets even more complicated when you get into things like employee experience and employee yeah. engagement and how are you going to measure those things. And some of you do and don't have responsibility for measuring those things as well. But yeah, absolutely. Point number one is what actually are you trying to measure? Do you have a really clear idea of what the thing is that you want a measurement of before you start looking around for what are the things? The absolute cardinal error is to start without doing that and just see, right, what measurements exist and then how shall I use them? And yep. this is this is such a common error, it has a name. I, I, it's called the McNamara fallacy, um, which dates right back to the Vietnam War when the US Secretary of Defense was trying to work out whether the US was winning. And he decided to count dead bodies because that's what could be counted. And he came to the conclusion mm -hmm. that the US was winning. And of course they weren't, but he was able to say that they were because he was counting the thing that was countable and, and took no aspect of how the Vietnamese people felt about the situation. So 
Don't yeah, I think and McNamara hold on. fallacy. <laughs> yeah, and I think that it's telling that the way we talk about employer branding involves referring to the Vietnam War. Right. And I think I think that's telling on a lot of levels that this is a bit of a and here's another word quagmire. It can be a mess. It can be very hard. And you're right. It, we are you know when we're in a situation we are overwhelmed with data. We just assumed oh we just there's a magic formula. You pluck it out of the air. And the truth is it's it's not so much about the numbers per se. It's about the thinking ahead of the numbers to say, what exactly are you trying to get out of this? Exactly. Right. In the Vietnam War, counting bodies is a data point that's easily accessible and you can collect them and that's great. But what is really going on? And that's the, the, the part where uh, I think people who don't live in a data space get confused. They think the data is there to give them an answer. And the truth is most of the time data gives them better questions at best. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing is, of course, that everyone listening to this podcast has done the strategy bit properly. And during the strategy phase, as we advise them to, they've set themselves some really specific objectives of what they're trying to achieve. In which case, you're, when you come to measurement, things become very easy because you've got a very definite idea of what it was you were actually trying to do in the first place. And therefore, that should be dictating you know, totally. what, what you are then going to use as your measures of have I succeeded or not. If you didn't do that phase early on, then this bit becomes really difficult because you are now scrabbling around of what data points are available and how am I going to try and tie them back in a way that says, please don't fire me. And in fact, please give me more budget for next year. Yes. And it's a very messy situation to find yourself in. I mean, maybe, maybe to get things wrong, I, I tend to talk to clients about there are three kinds of measures that you mm. might use. And they are of, of in order in order of increasing importance, but also increasing difficulty of actually tracking them. So, and, and that's not and that's not random. That is that is yeah. by design almost, right? So, so, kind of the easy but least important thing to measure, but you should definitely do it, is measure the actual project you have done. So, yeah. did it happen on time? Did it happen to budget? Did it happen in the way that you said it would? Are the stakeholders involved happy with the way that it happened? And, and to some extent, you're measuring the project itself. So if we created a toolkit for our employer brand, how many people downloaded it and are they using it? Yeah, it's a basic kind of uptake and acceptance kind of measure. But these are measures of your project, not of the brand or of the reputation. They are really measures impact. of did I do my project properly? And it's definitely a thing you should do, but probably nobody cares except you and your immediate line manager and your agency who will care about it a lot, but no one else yep. in your business cares about these measures. They should be very important to you. And then I want to point out that that's not, hold on, hold on, that that's not just an agency thing. I know that because we're kind of sitting in an agency space, we, 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 mm. we are thinking in terms of agency. If you're doing this completely in-house, when yep. you start a project, you should also measure this. You rewrote all the job postings. Did it, was it, were, yes. were recruiters happy? Did hiring managers use them? Did they show up? Are, you know, is there feedback on it? So being able to, and, and, you know, to some, to some extent, because in-house employer branders tend to be in this weird amorphous space where they don't have yeah. very strong metrics. This is a great starting place to hold yourself accountable. A word that we don't use enough because, but it's still crucial. Exactly. So let's say at the start of the project, you set yourself an objective to make the job adverts better. So you mm -hmm. might want to look at, okay, how am I going to measure whether the job adverts are better? But also, how do I measure how the people writing those job adverts in talent acquisition feel about the task? Do they feel like life's got easier and life's got quicker? Actually, you might have achieved quite a lot if they say, meh, I don't know if it's better, but I am doing it faster. You've just made them more productive. Okay, that, That's a okay. good thing that you have achieved. Yeah. And so looking at some quite look, hard tax things about what has been the impact of my particular project, good and bad, and tracking that is important. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, but the, the, what you shouldn't do with that stuff is go and show your CEO that stuff. They don't care. It's too, yeah. like, no. it's too no. close to you, but you should care about it massively. Your manager should care about it. This is the thing that will probably get you a, a kind of a pat on the back if you can yeah. show you've done some really good stuff here. And it's valuable to say, okay, I put X amount of work into it. I got Y output. Would it have been better to hire a consultant, an expert to come in and just kind of knock it out? Yeah. Right. There are, there are times when you go, look, I don't have any money, so I'm gonna have to do it on my own. And I come from that school. So I'm all about that. But it doesn't mean you're good at it. And it doesn't yeah. mean the fact that you could cobble it together, that there wasn't a better approach. And in fact, taking the first shot is a great way of actually 
proving that yes. there's a demand for this, a need for this project, a need for this idea, you are just not completely equipped to fulfill the need of that idea. At which point you could say, hey, can I get 20 grand? Can I get a grand? Can I get whatever I need to get some support to make this happen? And this is where you're going to stray slightly over from, so the, sort of from project measures into project outcomes. And this is where you're going to start going, go. okay, so what about the things that then happened as a result of this? So depending on what the objectives you set yourself were, this might be, have I improved employee engagement? Have I improved application numbers? Have I improved application quality? Have I improved hiring capabilities? Have I, you know, the, these are where you're going to start getting into stuff that is more kind of, bigger metrics that possibly are no longer your sole responsibility anymore. And these yeah. are things that other people are involved in as well, but that your project is influencing and helping with. A, if you know, if the hiring managers are awful and putting everyone off, you're still not going to hire anyone, but this is no, you know, that's not your fault. You are a contributor to this stuff. And some of it you'll be able to track really, really well, particularly anything digital, you'll be able to track really well. Some of it you won't be able to track quite as clearly and you're going to have to sort of get into well, we did this project and this has gone up over here. That can't be a coincidence time, but you, it's going to be awfully difficult for you to prove exactly that this is this is kind of what you were responsible for. And then the layer even further away is the business outcomes, which is what the business mm -hmm. really cares about, which is profit, productivity, utilization, new clients. Car savings. Exactly. So the, the the big business numbers over there, and you are now an even smaller contributor to those. You are a contributor to them, but it's very, very difficult for you to draw a precise line saying, well, we redid the website, and so now we're more profitable. But that's a very, very <laughs> difficult diagram. For you. The word you're looking for is tenuous at best. <laughs> well, yeah, the thing is, for some of you, it won't be. There are some of you where this is stunningly easy to do, and there are some of you where this oh. is impossible to do. So I'm going to give you an example of where this was very easy for us to do, because actually it kind of surprised me how easy it was. I did some work a while ago where we were talking with a client who uh, runs an outsourced call center for mm -hmm. other institutions, and so they are basically selling the time of people in seats. And the more people they have sitting in seats, the more money they can make, because literally yeah. their product is how many people do we have in chairs on any oh. given day. And so yeah. actually you can put a number and say, we did this project and now we have more people on seats and fewer of them are off sick. And therefore we made an extra $10 million last month. So, mm -hmm. and, and it is actually that straightforward to go, here is the profit of what we have done. But most of you don't live in that world. Most of you are not going to be able not? to draw that line. <laughs> I, and that's the thing that makes me crazy. It's like, look, there's the, you have entire teams see, who work for the CFO who do nothing but calculate, you know, costs and values and spending and all that yeah. stuff. Why can't we calculate the value of or the, the cost of an empty seat, if nothing else, just simply that? And most companies toy with it at best. They, they kind of dink around, they play around, and well, it's, it's roughly this. And that number is so soft, it makes it impossible for talent acquisition to say, okay, it, thus, it's imp we can spend a hundred thousand dollars because we know we can make that number go up by twenty percent, saving us two hundred thousand dollars. And but those numbers get fuzzy at that stage, and I was it, it just boggles the mind for me. It's just that businesses should care about that stuff more. It kind of depends how homogenous your business is, how easy that is mm -hmm. to do. So if you work for a law firm, someone will oh, have yeah. a number for. The lawyer at this level should be utilized at this rate, should be billed out at this much, should be spending this much of their time. Right. Actually, that is very well quantified. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's much easier for you to say, right, because I reduced turnover by 5%, there is a cash value which I can put on that because we know how much that person is worth and how much money they generate every week. Yeah. But if you don't work for a big homogenous business like that, that's a lot harder to do. Right. Yeah. And for many of you, you don't have that number. It would be awfully difficult for you to create that number. You know, I was chatting to our, our, our RFD earlier saying, could we do this? And it was like, mm, that would be quite difficult for us to do. Which is amazing because you charge hourly roughly. I mean, you're one of you're, you're the kind of business where you should know the relative value of each individual person fairly precisely. But so even for you, it's tough. Yeah, completely. Because actually, the reality is none of us are at 100% utilization. So if someone's True. not there, it doesn't necessarily mean we're making less money than we were. Yeah. It just means it's not quite as straightforward as that. And I think, you know, when you when you start talking about measurement, the biggest mistake you can make with measurement is to try and use too many of them and mm -hmm. and start using things that are no longer credible or that have no credibility with the person that you're showing it to. 
Yeah. And I think you, you need to think through when I'm doing this measurement, you might measure lots of stuff, but what you show to who depends on who those people are. Mm -hmm. And so your CEO, unless you're a very small company, your CEO probably isn't interested in cost per hire because no. that's not the thing that, whereas they are more interested in something like employer reputation they are interested mm -hmm. in. How well are we regarded is something that they're interested in. Whereas if you're talking to the head of talent acquisition, they are totally interested in yes. cost per hire and time to hire. They are, you know, that's going to be something that's relevant to them. So you might, as the employer brand person, measure lots of different things, but you might need to share different measures with different people because they're the ones that are yeah. relevant to their role and which bits they're going to be interested in. And some of them, I'm afraid, are only interesting to you and are yes. not interesting to the rest of your business. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be measuring them. Absolutely do. But yeah. you, you kind of I need to think through who you're going to, yeah, who you're going to show yeah. what. And we dive into that pretty well in the, I think I've said episode six, talking to strangers, where we're talking the different levels of the Completely. business and what they care about, what they need to know about. And I think it's interesting. And, and I'd like to get your, your, before we kind of pivot right back to the actual conversation at hand, yeah. what is your take on, so obviously most businesses treat talent acquisition as a cost center, meaning it is a thing the business has to spend money on and it cannot extract monetary value. That would be called a profit center. That's your sales team. That's your product team that, you know, I'm just saying this is MBA, MBA 101, right? Is there value in trying to quantify from a, just a, a value standpoint, a, a brings money into the business standpoint for TA to stop treating itself like a cost center, at which point your metrics are all about how much can we save? How much can we, you know, squeeze value out of the money given to a profit center where you're showing by investing in TA, you're actually getting value for the rest of the company. Is that a pipe dream? Is that just a kind of a nice, warm teddy bear you hug at night to feel better about the world? Or is that something we can actually make happen? No, I think I think you can definitely do that. I mean, back to that, you know, at a, one end of things, there's that call center environment I talked about earlier, where they can absolutely point to we are a profit center because there is more mm -hmm. business out, there is more new business coming our way than we can handle. We yeah. are the people who determine how much. And some businesses are in that place right now is they have more work on than they have people to do it. The more people they hire, the more money they can make. In that yeah. case, you can you are definitely now a profit center, really, because you are the determinant of how much profit that company can make. And there's, I mean, you're in that situation right now because you are really struggling to hire and you're not struggling to find work for your business or you know clients or customers or whatever it is you do so you can definitely do that i think the other one is much more subtle and is harder but is also of value which is the trying to prove that there is value to the business in the quality of the people that you hire and that that makes a difference so let's take a, a an example i can talk about right you could go a creative is a creative is a creative but I know some creative teams are better at doing oh, no. brilliant concepts and winning awards than other creative yeah. teams. The quality of the creative teams that we hire at 33 is absolutely crucial to the value of our whole business. Because if we didn't have those award winning teams, people wouldn't want to come and work with us. And it, it absolutely yeah. affects our new business pipeline. And we know this factually. We know that lots of clients, when they talk to us, one of the reasons they have first got in touch with us is we had a search round for who builds websites and we saw you've won loads of awards for winning websites. Right, so we know there is a cash value of having the kinds of creatives who can build award-winning websites because if they mm. weren't doing that, this new business pipeline disappears. Yeah. And so some of you will be able to do that. Some of you, that's a lot harder to draw that mm -hmm. line between the quality of employees and a positive financial outcome. Yeah, so it, it, it's a function of some jobs, or I'm not going to say commoditize, even though that's the word that springs to mind, is that sometimes no, some sure. jobs have a, have a minimal variance of how the much value a yes. mediocre player and a great player can make. Like if you're a, if you're talking about a restaurant, the executive chef has a huge impact. Yes. They have a huge variance on how much they bring. The line cook, a yes. good line cook and an amazing line cook, very close, very, very close. And they're not going to change the game. They're not going to change the business. They're not going to have a Johnny Ives kind of effect on the business. And so absolutely, where you're, so when you're measuring quality of talent, quality of applications and quality of hires, it is on primarily jobs which have a huge variance of value it brings to the company. 
So what we're really talking about here, like, in fact, let's let's bring in any cash freight, catch freight. What we're talking about here is employee fungibility. It's how interesting. Okay, I think okay I'm done. Employee fungibility, <laughs> I think, has to be it has to be our watch. But no, I mean, it, you're right. It's if I took the average person at this job and swap, you know, is there any difference between good and okay? Yeah. And yeah. How much do, a call, yeah, call center? inbound sales, you know, coordinator. Uh, there are a lot of roles where it's like, look, and, and they are very often junior roles. They're more entry levels because yeah. that's how you kind of cut your teeth and figure sh figure your stuff out. Yeah. But there are plenty of more senior roles where you're like, look, the difference between this person and this person is not going to be a huge change to the company. But you, you can spot these roles really easily, which is where is the loads of salary variation? Yes. In roles where there's loads of salary variation, it's normally because there is genuine difference in terms of the impact of having someone really good versus having someone mediocre um, yeah. you will see a lot more variation in the salary awarded to that role than in roles where frankly everybody who does once they've reached a minimum level of competence there's comparatively yeah. little difference but yeah it's threshold based well exactly and then it will be about simply okay is there an empty chair value to how much I am able to keep those seats filled because who's in them is less important than how many of them are full versus versus yeah. how many of them are not. But yeah, I mean, that's this is the conversation that we get into whenever people go, what's going to be the return of return on investment of yeah. doing this thing? 